Hey, folks, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're recording from the Hoboken Historical Museum's Upper Gallery. We call this show the Upper Gallery Talk Series. And uh, my name's Bob Foster. I work with the museum. And uh, you can uh, see this, obviously, on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter. We're actually not recording live today, uh, but uh, this is going to be a great archive show. And past artist talks have included interviews with Donna O'Grady, Lou Carbone, Bill Curran, just about every artist in town that interprets Hoboken has exhibited here at the museum. And today we have one of our painter favorites, uh, someone I've known for a long time, and it's Frank Hannavan. So Frank's exhibit opens this Sunday, November 14th. Uh, the reception goes from two to five and it will be on display until January 2nd. So we got a few weeks here. You'll take us into 2022. And you can see information about the hours of the museum. But again, this Sunday's reception will be from 12 to 5 in the upper gallery. And Frank Hanovan is, is uh, sitting right here with us. Welcome, Frank. Hi, folks. Good to see you. Uh, and uh, we're very excited whenever Frank decides to display his work here in the museum. Uh, generally, the mission of the Upper Gallery is to display artists who interpret Hoboken. And I can't think of an artist who does that more than Frank. Well, thanks. So, <laughs> so what's, what's different? We think this might be your fourth exhibit over the last 20 years here at the museum in the Upper Gallery. What's different about this group of work? Well, um, the painting is the same. It's acrylic on canvas, and the te you know the 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 method of going and painting it, in, you know, standing right in front of the subject and doing the painting from life is the same. But my approach has changed. Um, like if you look at the arc of my painting career, it starts in college. I learn how to paint, but then I'm out on my own and I develop my own way of painting, and. I was not trying to consciously steer the bus. I was trying to just paint and let it go whichever direction it was going to go in, which I thought was um, defensible. I wouldn't have to say, oh, there's a art-ism and I am following the rules of that one. I was just going to paint and do, do what I liked. But I found that the painting, um, as you'd expect, if you're painting for a decade and then another decade, it's going to develop. You're going to have a style that will it'll start it'll start just encrusting things that you learn will stack together and you'll get like now there you are and and i've always felt like i should be hands off with that i shouldn't be making deliberate changes like i'm going to start using a lot more blue or i'm going to start doing this texture or i'm going to i wasn't going to consciously do anything that i was going to i was just going to go and observe it what i was looking at and paint it on the canvas but i found that i was getting tighter which means picture a blurry image and you focus it and the focus becomes sharp my paintings were getting sharper and sharper and sharper so if you had an image with an automobile in the background you could now see all four tires and the license plate whereas maybe when i got started you could see one of the tires and the shape was vaguely like a car so i i, I didn't want to go back to the way i was painting but I found that the way I had been painting and getting tighter and sharper was becoming dissatisfying. Like I would wake up year after year and I'd be kind of doing the same thing where I've been focusing on, I don't know what I was focusing on. Like, I, like following the little rules that I'd set up for myself, I was going to keep on getting more focused. And at a certain point I realized too focused. <laughs> Interesting. So <laughs> we'll look at some of the paintings, uh, but in our background here is obviously a classic Hoboken scene with the New York skyline and the important foreground of the Mr. Softy truck. Uh, and so I guess you could relate what you're just saying to that this is a more recent painting. It is. Right. And you talked about the earlier paintings being more, in a sense, tighter uh, more laser focused in a way. Yeah, uh, like like a granular detail would be, 
I don't know, like you could, you could zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and you'd see more and more detail. Right. So I guess you could describe that as super realistic or realistic, the older work. Right. And I would always bristle when people would say it was photorealist. And I would say, well, no, it's not photorealist. I come from a different background. But it was in truth, it was heading towards photorealism. Right. Although I'd always argue you need a camera, but that's another argument. Right. right. And then there's that <laughs> whole thing where someone will, might have looked at some of your earlier work and go, Wow, I thought it was a photograph, which mm -hmm. doesn't really probably set make you satisfied. To they hear they that. mean it as a compliment, they but do. I, always, I always take it as like you're cringing. A tiny, I can see a it. tiny slap in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can understand that. Okay, I hope people are following our detailed, realistic conversation here. Yeah, we jump but, right. I apologize because like you ask one question and then I'm like page six of my no it's okay about. it's fine and okay. uh so we we wouldn't expect anything other than this <laughs> conversation so the background is uh, i'm sorry the painting that is our background tonight is a recent painting yeah did it over the summer and yeah. so here in hoboken standing right. in like in front of that mr softy truck so if you're gonna so you're saying this is the new style the new frank the new painting style yeah and would we call it a little more impressionistic. Yeah, I, I would say it's impressionistic. And I'm also, I'm, you know, if I see this through the eyes of somebody who'd seen my painting in the past, they might not necessarily think this is a big change, you know, because the subject matter and the qualities of the light and all that. But like to my eye, I'm handling the paint differently. And like the, the way the paint is being allowed to remain where it is instead of being endlessly modified and second guessed. Right. You know? I'm going to guess people who know your work are going to notice the change. I'll be curious to see. You yeah. know, these guys love to come to my art show. I mean, come to my art show. Yeah, definitely. The uh, there's a lot start. of people who are collectors <laughs> of your work. Uh, yeah. Someone like Ruth Walker. Ruth uh, Walker. Hi, Ruth. The Villamars. I mean, a lot of people. And yeah, I'm, I'm going to be interested to see how they react. Uh, yeah, I'm a little nervous. Um, but, you know, because I was doing these paintings on site in Hoboken people have seen it already so like that's true and I have had like nobody said like oh my god what are you doing they they all seem to like it right. but neither did anybody come up and say oh that's really different you know they, right. there are people who'd seen me painting for years to their eyes and maybe to the people who view the show they might not see it as a dramatic change but for me from my perspective as a painter this whole year has been very different. You know, the way I, the way I feel right. about it, the way I'm doing it, it changed. It's definitely, I feel a change. So I'm just going to throw it out there. Obviously, we're, we think we're seeing, getting through the tunnel. We're a little past COVID. A lot of the real lockdown stuff is over for mm -hmm. good, we hope. Not and yeah. you probably were not painting as much outdoors no. during that time. Yeah, the, uh, last summer, not the, the summer we just completed, but the previous summer, summer 2020, um, I did paint a little bit, but not very much outside. Right. Would you paint outside with a mask? I did. You did? Oh, I did. Right. I, yeah, 2021, I kept the mask on. I had tan where like only this part was tan and this part was white. Because I was just, yeah, I was wish never I had outside taken a without... picture of that tan line from your mask. <laughs> right. um, I'm just going to throw it out there that I really like the new style. Oh, thanks. And thanks. Um, I, I think it's harder as one gets older to change style. And when you hear people affirm what you've been doing and to sort of change it up, it's kind of brave. And not sure if it has anything to do with COVID and, you know, just trying to find a new. Uh, relevancy through your painting or anything like that but i'm just gonna i really endorse the new style well thanks yeah i do wonder like well what prompted the change mm -hmm. and um i also have like a certain sensitivity like oh that's i'm making a noise under the table i can see our okay the tech is not happy with the table noise um I don't want to refute the paintings I've done before and say like, that's all in the past. And like the real paintings are now like th those other paintings are fine. They're, you know, they're just as valid and they're part of the, like my development as a painter. So I don't want to like, I worry that as I talk about like changing my style that I'm discarding the old style. Yeah. You know, or, uh... cause I did actually go back into the studio and do two paintings you'll see in the show. And they're very much like the, another method. Because there, I was working from photographs, uh -huh. and so I don't know if you can paint impressionistically working from a photo. I haven't tried it, but like what I was doing was 
what I would say the older style. Of okay. It. Yeah. And just stating the obvious, uh, you sometimes people would describe you as a plein air painter. Yeah. Uh, can you describe that term? Just to... <clears throat> yeah, we covered it actually the last time okay. was in the Hoboken Speaks, but my, my spiel on that is that it's a French word. Uh, plain air is not spelled in English the same way. Plain air, it's plein air. But it was a, a French term for the French Impressionists. And it meant that you were painting outside the, in the open air. And like they, I guess in the 1860s, they needed a new word for it because it was kind of unusual to have people painting outside because people had, to that point, mostly right. painted. Indoors. So let's go to the slides. And uh, when you mentioned the plain air, it just reminded me. Oh, yeah. Me nice visually. segue. Look at that. Yeah. We're, we're uh, looking at totally my Totally unplanned, obviously. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, so, uh, so you're painting... Uh, the skyline i take it yeah this is a photo that i took so i stepped back from the easel and photographed it myself and that's my easel and you can see i'm, I'm at the end of pier a park in the hudson river and i'm painting the river if you, you can actually see depending on your monitor the painting on the canvas is just water and sky right and i'm just painting the water in the sky and i guess i put the, the the skyline in and then on the ground face down wrapped in paper is another painting so there's two paintings i was working on and this is what I was doing a couple of years ago. I would work on two paintings at the same time. Didn't do that that much this year. But right. this is this is my setup. The acrylic paint is sit on the palette, which is then that uh, you can see there's a rag and there's a can full of paintbrushes sticking out. And that horizontal thing that the smears on it is my uh, the palette, which has the wet paint on it. And there's a folded up piece of uh, of like cardboard uh, foam core with a, a spray bottle with water. So the folded up part is creating a shadow so the sun doesn't dry the paint on the palette. And the spray bottle is water that I spray on the paint on the palette to keep it, again, from drying up in the sun. And I take it the two painting uh, is so that you can sort of change the light and chase the light later Exactly, in the day. yeah, during the day, you know, most people won't have to take notice of this, but if you're painting something and the sun goes behind a cloud, you're painting now, you can keep painting it, but you're looking at a different subject because now everything has changed. Literally everything has changed. Everything you see is being illuminated by the sun. So if a cloud comes, everything in the shadow of the cloud changes its tone. And then if you're trying to copy that as in a painting, if you're trying to make a painting of those things you know, as accurately as possible, you better stop painting when this cloud comes by. <laughs> because <laughs> you're going to be working against yourself. The sun will come back out and now you've got to undo what you were doing. Right. Um, you also have the issue of wind when you're out on Pure, I would imagine. Right. And I'm sure that if it was windy, you'd see that I had tied the easel to the railing, which I've done many times in the past. Right. Because the danger is, of course, a gust of wind is going to put your painting the right painting. into the Hudson and, <laughs> and then it's over with. I always worry I'll drop a paintbrush and it'll roll off the side and then right into the Hudson. Right. Okay. And uh, yeah. Uh, I like that you included that shot, and I'm sure a lot of people have seen you around town with that easel. With all that. the all the time I've been painting ever since I got uh, to New York, and then to Hoboken, and now living in Jersey City, I've used that same model easel. It's the Stanwright Company went out of business, and that's the Model 100 easel. It's an aluminum folding easel that collapses like a like a photographer's tripod. So you're saying you use the same modest easel? Same, all well, not years? the same unit. Like okay. I bought new ones as they sure. come and gone, but now they're not in production anymore. So I think I have three at home, and like when they're gone, I don't know what'll happen. eBay. So yeah, okay. eBay. Okay. Yeah, eBay. Um, okay, we're moving on to some new. The visuals. next one is the same easel, but this was this, a setup <laughs> in the in the rain, and I'm painting in Manhattan here, and I'm carrying everything with me in the plastic bag on the ground is the canvas tote bag and in that is a, where i'm carrying my uh maybe i've got some lunch in there i've got a change of clothes i've got uh, a book to read on the subway and then in the backpack which is hanging underneath the easel is the paint and the brushes and all that and then um you can see i've attached a umbrella to the easel and then i've turned that umbrella into like a tent by clipping a plastic sheet so I'm mostly enclosed in this little space and I can get the painting done. Remember, this is water-based paint. So as the rain is coming down, it's trying to destroy my painting. So I, like, I'm trying to keep the water off the surface of the canvas and off of the palette because the palette could just turn into just a wet um, puddle. 
Uh, that's, but that's pretty elaborate it's, setting. But trying to get the rainy view of the sidewalk uh, any other yeah. way is really like you have to sure. really be there. No, you have to that's, try to, yeah. you got to see it live. That's right. kind of what you're saying. And then, of course, uh, you generally get to these locations by bicycle. Right. So you need to transport uh, all this material on your bicycle. Yeah, everything, everything you see here I'm carrying, and then I'm also riding on a bicycle with it, too. Yeah. Pretty amazing. <laughs> Okay. Um, so that's what it looks like when I'm out there painting. You could see, Bob, you noticed right away my right hand uh, pants leg is rolled up. <laughs> and I forgot that I did that. But like it, you could see my bike in the background leaning against the store window. Right. I, like you roll up your pants leg so you don't get the bicycle grease from the chain on your, on your uh, ankle there, on your pants. Right. But this right. is typical scene of me painting in Hoboken. And people, I'm sure, have seen this before. And you could see the painting behind the easel that was from earlier today. And I think both the paintings in this photograph are in this show. Oh, so cool. You'll, you'll be able to see, like, you can't see the one that's on the ground, but that's the one that was in Stevens Park. I paint there in the morning. The sun would change. And then the western side of Washington Street would now be in shade because it's the summer. I don't want to be in the direct sun. So I wait to paint the western side of the street until after the sun has moved across the sky, yada, yada, yada. The only, the only other thing I point out here is um, I thought this was so clever of me. Um, I need water to do the painting, so I have to bring water with me, and that weighs a lot. So I was looking for a source of water in Hoboken so I could just fill up my water bottle when I got there and not have to schlep the water carry up down the stairs, blah, blah, blah. And uh, City Hall has done this like green initiative where they're collecting the rainwater on the roof of City Hall comes down the gutter and now they're catching it in these cisterns i think that's what you call them these galvanized tin things and they have a little faucet spout and sure enough uh, you can get water out of there don't drink that water guys but there is available rainwater, and so um i'm doing the i'm just so happy that i'm doing these hoboken paintings and i'm using hoboken rainwater in the painting so there's no fluoride in there <laughs> there's no uh, I don't know why I find that so, so amusing. <laughs> everything about your work here for this exhibit is Hoboken it's all, centric. Yeah, yeah. Next time uh, I'll be weaving think, the canvas out of Hoboken plants that I grow, but I, that's not going to happen. Okay, so I've well, gone as far as I can. I, I think the folks at City Hall who initiated that program could use it in the next grant funding. To right. Say, yeah. Whoever even they are, the local artists are using our water. Right, but they would also be the first ones to say, don't drink that water. It's, right. it's from the roof of the building. Sure, not, yeah. but you're not but, drinking it. But whoever you know started that uh, that program, I'm very grateful. Uh-huh. Sounds good. So I know we have a few slides in a series here, and you're what are you trying to get across to us? This is a detail. Yeah, well, this is just a picture of my hand painting. You know, this is... <laughs> Chill. <laughs> there, how about I cross my arms and say nothing now? <laughs> <laughs> no but it's like an action shot this is what i see i'm just standing there painting it and i am looking at what i'm seeing obviously as we all do but then i'm trying to like hold that image in my mind mix up the proper color and then apply it to the canvas in the right place so then i look back at the reality so i would have glanced up at the tree where the light's coming through the tree i'd say to myself is that the right color blue and then i would look again at what i just painted and then i would look at the palette and like sometimes i'd say it's too bright or it's too dark so i'm either going to add white or i'm going to mix it up again with less white in it and then i'll go and put it on there again now this this second guessing yourself and putting that second dab of paint on there um this gets to the heart of uh what is different about my technique this year where i keep saying my new technique what i would do in the years prior to this year is i wouldn't feel concerned that i got the color right the first time i put it down on the canvas because i knew that i was going to come back and second guess myself and apply some more paint to that same spot but this time refined a little bit and what i kind of wanted to do this year would be to pare down that process where i, I don't keep going back and dabbing and going back and dabbing and going back and dabbing trying to hit that same little like something smaller than a postage stamp folded in half. I wanted to just do it right the first time and move on. So what that meant for me mentally was I had to be better prepared to do the brush stroke correctly just once, which I didn't really achieve, but I'm trying to do it 
um, where the brushstroke itself is holding all the information it needs to in the first go. And that there won't be a need for second, third, fourth, and fifth applications of paint on that same spot as I slowly move towards this better description of what I'm painting. Because at a certain point, you pass a point where it's fresh and spontaneous looking because now it starts to look labored and you can, you know, the eye can see like, wow, this painting's overpainted. And if you could see my air quotes, I'd be saying it's overpainted where you can paint it too much. And in terms of, are you using the same fine brush throughout this uh, painting? No, that's a good question. Cause I, I, in the past, the answer would have been yes, Bob, I'm using this number three O brush for the whole painting. Cause I'd be going over every tiny little area with this one tiny little brush. So I'd go through a bunch of these little tiny brushes. Now I'm using more uh, a wider range of brushes that have a, a wider tip at the end because I'm, I'm suiting the brush more to the single brush mark that I'm trying to make. And I'm, I have to keep amending that and say, I'm not really doing it like I'm saying I'm doing it. I'm not just putting one brush stroke and moving on. And that brush stroke is the one you see when you come to the art show. But I'm trying to get there. I'm mm -hmm. trying to be that way where I'm 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 painting less, but the effort that goes into making that little mark is um, like there's more calories being burned per brush mark. You know, am I saying that right? Are you getting what yeah, I'm trying to say? There? Yeah, like I, it's front loading all the effort. Do all the effort at the beginning. Don't stretch out the effort over days and days. So these paintings that I've done at the for, that you'll see in this art show were done in a much much shorter amount of time. But I would say that I was you know, causing my brain to age faster because I was like putting more and more effort. It was kind of excruciating. <laughs> so that's a good point. I mean, our, let's say you come to Hoboken, you set up your scene, you're all ready to go. Right. Which setup takes a little while too. Yeah. And because yeah. you got to make sure you're not blocking pedestrians and is there going to be a big truck parking in that space to block your view? So once you get set up, are you there for two hours? Kind oh, of more, it's or? more than that. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm expecting to spend, like I won't have any other plans for the day unless I'm doing that morning one and afternoon right. one. But I'm probably putting at least three hours into each of these sessions. And then how many sessions well, that's, for a painting? That's the big question. Um, the one that I did in Stevens Park, which is the largest painting here, took a lot longer. So there's something about the larger, it was 30 inch wide canvas and the picture of it is not here. So mm -hmm. bringing it up maybe isn't so appropriate, but it's about four times as wide as the painting that you're looking at in the picture here. Right. So, so I'm applying four of, times as much paint. Right. So I think it would probably take it, four times as much time. Right. To, but I think other people would argue and say like, well, no, because there's a big swath of grass in the foreground and that's all one color. <laughs> and you could probably just put that in with one paintbrush. Right. It's, it's, it's kind of a hard one to answer where you can come to a definitive sure, answer. Sure. But, uh, but would a painting like this take two sessions or? Oh yeah. This one, there's people who saw me painting it. who will know. They'll be like, Oh yeah, I saw him paint there a couple of days, but then he was gone. Right. So I, w I don't remember how many days, but it could have been three or four. Mm -hmm. And again, like if the light changed and this often happens because it's reality, like some days we have a beautiful, blue sky and it lasts all day but more frequently it changes throughout the day and um you know if you set out down a road painting a, a bright sunny day with blue clouds or blue clouds blue sky with white clouds um it's better to come back on a day that's the same way and if the day that you have changes you should stop is what i'm saying right I, maybe there'd be other painters who would disagree but they're not here to be interviewed right now is this and talking about how i like to do it would you i don't know this gets into the weeds a little but like in let's this, go in this let's picture the there weeds. are those crossing stanchions oh uh, yeah which somebody came are, and took them away <laughs> which, well that was my question i mean they're kind of indicative of what's been going on in hoboken where they'll close the street off oh so you knew for what those are for i was going to explain to people but you know yeah um, they, i'm just they, guessing there no they, be they, lots they, of they close off this little section on the weekends i guess yeah first street is kind of hopping so they're kind of trying to be friendly to businesses so they'll just close the street off is it called the but open streets program it I could think. be yeah. it could be yeah from the same people who brought you that uh, rainwater. Uh, <laughs> right. yeah. But um, so my question is like, you could paint it on 
Friday and then you decide to come back Monday and the stanchions aren't there, but you got them in the painting. Right. Did you take them out? Well, a guy came and took them away and I left them in there because I liked the yellow in yeah. the picture. So sure. I'm saying you're allowed to break the rules, kids. Like okay. If, you're, if, you're, okay. if one rule says you have to change because the light changes, you can break that rule too. Right. But I don't know. I'm not, I mean, I'm not as an individual class, painter, so. you make up the rules. It's not right, a exactly. Process. Yeah. And and in painting, if nowhere else, the ends justify the means. So you're trying to get a good looking painting out of this. I remember in art school getting into an argument with a kid about the, the decorative nature of paintings. I was saying like paintings are decorative. And he was like, ah, that's terrible. Like it was almost like a political statement I'd made. But I do believe the painting should look good hanging on the wall and that it should be you know appealing to the eye. But I respect people who also feel that the painting has to have an idea behind it or it supports a theory. And it's almost like a diagram of an idea. And that's still valid. It doesn't, and th like that painting I'm describing doesn't necessarily have to look good. I sh it should be good. Right. You know, but how do we get, we went into the weeds. <laughs> sure. I'm going to take it <laughs> further. Said. I'm getting into this. <laughs> so here you pick the, you pick the scene you're painting. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and you could spend a week talking about that process. Right. But, and that yeah. that's because uh, you like the view. If there's a whole street of dumpsters, you're probably going to go, eh, I don't like that blocky form. I'm not going to put it in there. Um, but you wouldn't put in things just to fill the space in a sense, would you? To make it aesthetically I pleasing? I haven't gone there, but I could picture myself like as, a, as an eccentric millionaire closing down this street arranging with city hall and then like having anything i want placed there and then doing a painting of it you know like conceivably i could have said like if i knew somebody at city hall like look uh somebody just moved those yellow things away could you have them bring them back because i'm not done with them like right, I, like right. I like there's nothing wrong with manipulating the environment i i'd like to get rid of a lot of the cars or like if i could hand pick which cars would park mm -hmm. there because like i'm sorry you people who own the big black suvs they're very practical and you love them i'm sure but like when they park in where I'm painting, I suddenly like my heart just dies a little bit like, oh, no, now I have to wait for this guy. The cars that you see are sort of like the best worst choice because <laughs> I like as a, as the cars come and go and as they park and go, um, it's really it's an ugly car or it's an even more ugly car. So you have to choose which ugly car you're going right. to paint. It turns out the one in the right in this image doesn't look so bad. But sure. I kind of like the way cars looked 20 right. or 30 years ago. And those fresh direct trucks must be a real drag. Yeah, the delivery truck. The number of beer trucks in Hoboken that unload every hour of every day is astonishing. I cannot believe how much beer is being consumed by this city. It's just incredible. Because when you are on the sidewalk and you'll you'll see like, well, there's the hardware store. Ace Hardware has always got a truck outside because they must be doing a tremendous business. But the like nothing compared to the beer trucks. Oh, my God, there's so much beer. Right, right. Well, it's funny. You're seeing that street delivery perspective because you're out Yeah, there. I am a part of the sidewalk. So, like, I'll see, like, the, the, the mail delivery person, and they're there again. The same dog walking guy. I see him. Hey, dog walk guy, you know, because right. they see me. Sure. So all these people that I know, I don't know their names. They don't know my name, but we all know who we are. I saw so many people that I knew when I used to live here 20 and plus years ago this summer that I hadn't seen in the intervening years. There was something about this summer where I really saw and reconnected with all these people I hadn't seen in so long. Right. Every day I'd see a new person. And in fact, uh, Melissa Abernathy in her write-up of the show mentions that. like Because I had mentioned it to her when she was talking to me. On, Hi, Melissa. Are you watching? Hi. Um, um, I, where was I going with that? Now I forget. <laughs> Just you know the idea of seeing old friends. In oh a sense. right, yeah, all um, these people. Yeah, yeah, cool. Okay, we're people, gonna yeah. move on to the some more details. So this is kind of a closer shot, obviously a different scene. But... Yeah, I, this is like one of the Instagram pictures. While I'm painting, I'm like, wow, this looks really nice right now. And I just struck with it. And I'll take out my camera and photograph it and put it on Instagram. Really? But this painting is is in the is in the exhibit, too. It's the mm -hmm. Bloomfield painting. But like right. you're looking at just a tiny detail of it. And um, there has been a theme in my life lately where I'll see a detail of a painting like this, which I is revealed only through photography. Like your naked eye saw it, too. But like the way that photographs can frame it and crop it like that gives like it, it it appeals to me and then I, I might wind up painting this scene right here just from this photograph really you know rather than go back and try to reproduce it 
conditions on Bloomfield Street. This is Bloomfield and 10th Street. But you're going to edit north. out your fingers, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But like that little part, I think you could cut that part out and blow it up to, you know, 16 inches wide and it would look pretty good. Sure. Now, what I'd like to do would be to preserve the scale of those brush marks. So there's like a big blobby brush mark. You can see I just made the white one with a little shadow under it. Now, what I'd like to be able to do would be to paint this painting 30 inches wide, but still have a blob that big. So then that blob would be what, like six inches long. And I, I just haven't been able to achieve that in my painting. Like I really want to be able to put a blob of paint down like that one and have it kind of, uh, I don't know, like an actor goes on stage and only has two lines, but they, they did it so well and they were such a good performer that you remember them. That's kind of how I feel about that little blob of paint there. Like I want a bit, I, I want like a simple blob of paint to be the star of the movie, ah. you know? And I think in the past I was trying to get that by doing a whole bunch of little blobs. So it's going to get more impressionistic. That it, like the end result is like it equals dot, dot, dot impressionism right. yeah. for lack of a better word. Cause like the impressionist painters were painting with these globs of paint and they were criticized at the time for not refining the globs of paint. So like if you put two paint globs down next to each other, my tendency in the past was to put three smaller globs in between them to meld the two big globs together, right? So there's a part of my brain that wants to take that white blob that we're talking about and smear it in with my finger so that that one raised edge is now smoothed out. But now I'm slapping my hand away and I'm saying, leave it. It's fine. Like, just let it go. So, so next don't, year, right? Maybe I'll be painting with huge, like house painting brushes, and and like standing at arm's length. Right, right. Very cool. Well, I don't know if I, you know, plan to do. Part of the problem is the acrylic paint itself won't hold that thickness. The water evaporates out of it, and it shrinks down onto the canvas. So I was experimenting with adding a gel medium to the acrylic paint. Now we're talking about the nuts and bolts and the technical. There's there's a bunch of stuff you can add to paint to oil paint or to acrylic paint that make it behave different and, and dry different and look different when it's on the canvas. So I, I never used to experiment with that stuff either, but I started experimenting with uh, uh, modeling paste, which is really like a, like spackle, but for painters. And you can get, just as you can spackle a wall and put raised details that dry and then they're, they're on your wall, you can kind of get that with paint and you can add things to your paint to get it to thicken and stay thick. So I was experimenting with that this year, not as it, like the results of the experiments, not as well as I'd like to see. I don't know if it's if it's me or if it's the material isn't really up to what I want it to do. But uh, like just the idea that I'm willing to change my way of working and, and it, you know, adopt other materials or other brushes is just a, it's different from before. But, you so know, how do you years. deal with a wet canvas? Um, taking it home in a sense well the acrylic okay. dries so i don't have to worry about that oh, okay. by the end of the day on a hot summer it's all dry mm -hmm. but while you're painting it yeah like you can't really see it here but in the, if i if you turn my hand around so you saw the um what i'll call the karate part of your hand <laughs> like if you were karate chopping something the part that's impacting like under your little finger that on my hand at the end of the day painting is covered with all the bright on the, okay. The, no, I was thinking about a wet, getting a wet canvas home. To yeah, uh, oil painters have they they sell them this little thing. It's like a double ended push pin, and you take four of them and you put one in each corner, and then you stick it to a board, and then this prevents your spacing. wet canvas from okay. touching something. Right. Yeah. yeah, but acrylic paint dries so fast that that is not an I issue. I didn't realize that. Okay, yeah. we're moving on. So this is that sequence of photographs where I'm holding my watch in the foreground. So you can see it's 20 minutes to 12. And I started painting and I thought to myself, you know what, I'm gonna photograph every couple of uh, hours on this painting and then we'll have like a, a sense of what gets done. The first couple of hours of painting go so fast, it looks like the painting's almost done. Invariably, people walking by are like, oh, that's a great painting you've you know, finished painting. And I'll tell them, well, no, I'm actually just getting started on this painting. Even though I've covered all the canvas, I am not done yet because I still have to tune all the parts. You know, it's gotta, it's gotta be, I have to second guess myself. And, you know, anyway, like I start like this though. And um, usually I don't start with a, just a white canvas as in, as in here. Usually there'll be a gray wash over the whole thing. So a uniform gray, but for the purposes of this, it's not different. Uh, I have to establish where the horizon line is and the vanishing point. 
And you'll note it, like you can probably, your folks at home looking at this image, see there's a row of trees and a, and a lamppost making three vertical marks. And to the left, there's a circle with an X. Can you see the circle with the X? Mm -hmm. That's my vanishing point. So I established like where the, all the uh, lines and the perspective are all gonna move towards that point. Yeah, thanks Rand. So when I begin the painting, I'm gonna, I, I need to know where the trees are and then I worry about where everything in between the trees are. That's like the, the short way of explaining how I do a drawing. Cause it like, uh, there's always trees. So I guess if I was in a flat open field with no features, I'd kind of have to make it up as I go along. But what I do is I establish where these vertical, easy to see demarcations are. And usually that's tree trunks and it's things like the curb. And those are the first things that get drawn then because I'm going to use those as my reference points as I chart every other point on the canvas. So the, you need to know that where the horizon line is and you need to know where a few simple objects are so that you can measure everything from those landmarks that you set at the beginning. So it's really important that you set them in the proper place because if they're off a little, the whole painting will be off later. Wow. So the first part of the painting, I'm just making some marks and there's some blue in there, but it's immaterial. I'm just trying to make it darker. So then if you go to the next slide, as they say, slide, now I've filled almost everything in. The painting could almost looks done. But now look at the, the watch in the foreground. It's only, what, 35 minutes later. And the idea was I'm going to fill in all the tones and the major colors. So I'm, I'm looking at, like, at the upper left-hand corner, that there's, like, a pinkish rectangle. That represents all the buildings on the east side of Washington Street looking south with just one pink color. Because, it like, if you squint your eyes and look at it in the real world, it, it forms into just like a bright colored shape that's mostly that color. And that's at this stage in the painting, I don't want to be painting the car and the tire on the car and the hubcap on the tire. Like I don't want to go to that level of detail. I only want to look at the big shapes first and paint them in. And I want to get the tones correct. So the tone is like, is it black or is it white? In between there's gray and all the gray in between black and white will give you your tones. Like, the, the dark trees above, that's a dark tone. And the color is important that it's green, but also how dark or how light it is. And so at the beginning of the painting, I'm looking at tones and broad shapes of, and color. And you can see the three trees there still, or actually the nearest one is a lamppost. But those three things, I'm, I'm, as I keep looking up, I'm basing everything on those three things and the things around them. And then when I look back up onto the canvas, I know where I am. It's really easy to get, you know, you said down in the weeds, like you can get lost in like, picture you're painting a tree branch, you look away, you mix the color, you paint it, and then you go back and look for your branch again, and you gotta find it. It's sort of like, cause they all look the same a little bit, you know, but anyway. That's, that's pretty cool. Well, and let's see, another one from the series. Yeah, here it is almost an hour later and it hasn't changed that much because uh, the broad, tones and the the shapes of the original uh laying in of the color covering mm -hmm. up the white canvas haven't been changed but if you look carefully now you'll see like that rectangle on the left now is all stripes because i'm showing that there's different buildings in there so I'm, I'm refining and refining so this is a good way to illustrate what's different about my painting technique this year from last year last year i would keep refining so not only would I paint each one of those buildings and separate it from its neighbors, I would go into that individual building and look at what was different from one end of the building to the other. And then like that would be the windows, right? And then if I would go further, I'd be like, well, what's the, there's an upper window pane and a lower window pane, you know? And like I would, and maybe I wouldn't have, but I'm using it as an example. I, picture the, the, the vertical marks that I have representing the buildings. If I tried to add all the windows and all the window panes, upper and lower on each one, I'm spending hours and hours, but am I improving the painting? I'm, I'm working on a tiny air part of the canvas, right? It's only like 2% uh, of the whole image. It doesn't really matter for the whole picture. Better to focus on the entire painting. And, and maybe I never paint those little windows because maybe those little windows aren't even important, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. there's, if you look on the right-hand side, of the, I did paint the windows, so sometimes you do have to, and sometimes you don't. But I think if I 
if nobody stopped me, I would just keep painting and painting and painting until I'm down to the molecular level, painting all the molecules. Right. And that is wrong, you know? It's, it's pretty interesting. I mean, I hadn't thought about half the things you're saying, but sort of if you really get into the details on the right-hand side, you have to do the same thing every place else. So yeah. you're sort of bringing it up gradually. That's, that's an excellent point. And, yeah. and at some point, there's a little voice that says, stop, you're done. And because uh, if you go too far, it's overly detailed, perhaps. And it's hard to go back. Yeah. Once you've, like, you're reluctant to, to throw away the time and effort you put into something in the first place. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. But like another thing you said was uh, bringing the whole thing together at the end. Like if you bake something in the oven, the whole thing is getting baked at the same time. <laughs> like you can't bake half the pizza and then turn it around and paint the other. Pan. You know, like it wouldn't make any sense. So you should be doing the whole painting at once, which is hard to do. And when you go down in the weeds and these little details, you aren't seeing the big picture. So you are, you are like the right-hand side is suffering if you're spending all your time on the left-hand side. Right. And by the way, this one looks like the right-hand side is suffering a little bit. It might be that it's a but lot you're of not focus. done. You're not right. done. Right, it isn't done though. Right, yeah, yeah. Anyway. I think there's at least one more photo of this one. Okay. Yeah, this it's is a little detail. further along. So I think you... this one's illustrative because you can see like what I'm doing right now. There's a blob on top of a blob on top of a blob and you're seeing the freshest blob that's now going on there. And what the third blob represents is my third glance looking at it. Is that the right tone? No, I decided. <laughs> like the first blob, which is under that uh, post office box looking shape, mm -hmm. is more beige and it's a little darker. And then the second blob went on top of that is a little bluer. And then I must have decided that's too dark. And then I went back in with another blob. Right. It's funny, you know, you, let's say, how long have you been painting in Hoboken? You said 30 years? It's got to be 30 years, yeah. 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 And after it's a lot of blobs. <laughs> a lot of blobs. <laughs> and then the other thing I was thinking when I was looking at this, you know, uh, after 30 years walking around town and, you know, you get to know people and everyone's getting older and so on and so on. Yeah. I could swear I know who that is with the blue hat and the Oh, I'm really? sorry, the green hat and the blue shirt. Interesting. I'm not going to say because I'm probably wrong. But right? like, you know, just like you can see someone walking down the block and, you know, you know who they are from their walk. Yeah. When we all started wearing masks, I thought we're not going to know who we are. But like it was easy to know who we are. Like you'd see like that's certainly Joe, even though I can't see any part of his face. I know the way he walks. It's the walking. way he slouches. Right. Yeah. But I've had a problem where someone's really close. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, you're sort of looking into their eyes. I don't know who they are. And they're, they're they know who I am because right. I might have a distinctive hat on or something. Right. And I kind of joke that I only know who someone is or can really say, yeah, that's, you know, Tom is by their laugh. I know them by their laugh. Right. So anyway. Well, you know, on the topic of people and paintings, there's other painters that come to mind. Um, that put people in their paintings, obviously, right? We've all been since caveman days, right? The people in my paintings do not play this role where they are individuals and are, are, are important to the painting because of who they are. They're really just placeholder people, like they're almost like mannequins. Not that I want to dehumanize the painting, but here's what I'm getting at. A lot of people think they know who the person is in the painting, right, right? Right. or they think it's them. Um, I get really nervous when I'm painting a scene with a cafe because I want to have people in the painting and I want to paint them. I don't want them to know that I'm painting them just in the same way. If you're trying to get a candid photograph of somebody, you don't want them looking at the camera and aware. Um, and I'm very nervous when they get up to leave. I don't want them to come over and look because I'm going to feel I have this real sense of embarrassment. that they're right. gonna, yeah. Right. Or they're going to be like, that's not what I look like. And I'll be like, yeah, but I don't care. It's not, you're not, not like, don't that. take this personally, yeah, person. Exactly. I'm, you know, you're, I'm glad you're participating in my painting without <laughs> even giving your permission, but I'm not trying to put you on the canvas either. I did have a guy once asked not to be in the painting. I was painting him and he asked me to come out of the painting. Right. And I thought, really? Cause I'm, but I, you know, I, I thought that was kind of silly. Right. But there's portrait painters and there's people that put like where you, you need to know who's in the painting. Sure. Not, not necessarily in my right. painting. Right. I'm more like I'm happier with the blob that's mm -hmm. in this picture. Let's hear for blobs. Yeah. Now that would have been a good title for the show. No, no. Let's you did fine. <laughs> you did fine. <laughs> because they're it. not really blobs. Blobs well, make I keep, it sound How like... many times I get a word count? How many times have I said blob? I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure. Okay, we're blobbing on here. People are blobbed out ah, by now. Yeah. Okay. People are blobbed out. Again, the new style. Uh, look at those blobs. They shimmer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But I think if you were paying attention and you saw this painting, you'd say like, oh, yeah, and I always see what he means about those buildings in the upper left-hand corner. Mm -hmm. that, you know, they're, like, there's some windows in there, but I don't need to paint them all. I just need to show them. And I've used the, the phrase before, like a shorthand. It's a, I'm not writing the whole word. I'm using a shorthand that, you know, I've never learned how to do shorthand. But what it means is you're making a mark and it, rep it stands in and represents all these other things. Sure. And there's a lot in this painting that is unpainted. And, and that's why I like it. Like there's the whole center of the painting, the dining area where the main people are seated. There's this gray smear underneath the green marks that represent the tops of the table. Mm -hmm. I never would have allowed that to remain right. visible towards the end of the painting. And this show, uh, the title refers to Washington Street in a way, right? The, right. Um, I mean, most, I think the subject matter of is that all your paintings in this show are Washington Street? Nearly all. The right. uh, the one that serves as our backdrop right here in this window down here mm -hmm. is uh, not That's, Washington. Of course. Of and course. there's one of Stevens Park. But I'm going to say that Washington Street, starting with the summer, outdoor cafes, the eateries, it became visually more exciting. Don't you think? Right. And maybe people watching this a thousand years from now on YouTube, if it were still here, might not know the context of the COVID pandemic and the outdoor dining that was taking place at like all these restaurants put out extra seating and in fact built little paddocks and kiosks. And there was a lot more color on the sidewalk right. and a lot more fabrics, you know, of these campus of the the the, the surfaces of the umbrellas and the Shapes. various yeah, yeah. And it so it was a terrific visual environment. Yeah. So I think you've picked up on that for sure. Uh, we're moving on. And another scene. Some, yeah, some this idea of dying, uh, yeah. social drinking coffee, hanging out, I think uh, became more and more important. And I think Washington Street with the different programs really rose to the occasion. Yeah, and for, for my part, if you took away all those umbrellas, I'm not sure I'd want to stop and paint that scene. That's like kind of what I'm saying. Yeah, it's it, like you'd rather go for the more interesting uh, uh, flowers and plantings and things like that. Yeah, you want to break up the space. You can't just have like a – like the problem with painting in an urban environment is the foreground is always going to be this gray shape of a sidewalk in the foreground. So if you can break that up with other things – when I was younger, I would like do a painting and then I would cut off six inches from the bottom of the painting because it was just <laughs> it was just gray sure. colored sidewalk, and yeah. I realized it wasn't necessary for the composition, right? And right. was in fact detracting from it. <laughs> sure, sure. I and the then uh, I can't remember. I think it's Barbara Gross who is uh, has a collector of many of your paintings. Should go, yeah, and a How supporter come? of the museum, right? And, yeah. Definitely. And then. Uh, she'll always say Frank never puts in the poles oh, for right. the umbrellas, yeah. like they're UFOs. There's a literalism that uh, you have to struggle with if you're going to be in the fine arts. Like, like, uh, well, like if you're a writer writing a short story about something that happens in the kitchen, you don't necessarily have to write a sentence describing the inside of the kitchen. You just say it's a kitchen, and it's kind of the same in painting a little bit. Like, although it is visual and you are supposed to show everything. You don't need to see what kind of shoes these people are wearing. Um, you don't need to see some of the sidewalk stuff. Like there's a little iron fence around the tree, but I've really just shown a few little marks. Mm -hmm. which, you know, putting something like the pole that's holding up the umbrella becomes an awful lot like a dark black line in a painting. And you have to be careful with those because they wind up taking your eye and like they could be point, especially if they're diagonal. Unfortunately, they're not diagonal. So you don't have to worry about that with a pole, but I, yeah. Um, Barbara Gross would not be the only person to have pointed out that in some <laughs> of my paintings, there'll be some um, vertical elements of little thin things. And often it'll be like the, the, the ironwork on a brownstone uh, staircase, like, it won't really be feasible to in the real world this would fall over because there's nothing holding it up kind of but i'm painting enough to show what's what what needs to be shown and you don't need to see every little thing right and that's uh... um so we're going on we're moving forward here 
and uh, oh yeah, we're back to that one again. Yeah, we so th we've seen this one before, similar, and also they were the details, of the process of some of those. Oh right, this That's one you had my stanchion. hand. Uh, yeah, and this right. one is the other one that isn't Washington Street. What is sure. this? Newark Street? First Street. Okay. First Street. I always call it Newark yeah. for some reason. Newark. It, you know, it, it has could a be. It has a bicycle. Can you spot the bicycle? Newark. Folks at home. Yeah, I think Newark <laughs> goes the other way. We're looking. I'm always east embarrassed because I'm so bad at names. No, it's okay. And I could be wrong. Um, so we're going to move on from here. Oh, yeah. This is the last of the pictures that we have. Okay. And that shows the, the eatery, a nice shape in there, right? A yeah. Nice visual and, and, tone. And people in the science fiction future looking back, um, the, the object on the right-hand side with the two American flags, that would be a parking spot in normal days. But they, um, because of the pandemic, we're allowed to have... Um, dining in the street. So the restaurants were able to build these temporary structures, which uh, like this one had like flower plantings around it. Yeah, it some are really, really ambitious. Nice. I don't know how temporary they are, right. but would you rather paint an eatery or a car? Into your right. Paintings? You heard me insult the cars of Hoboken. There are nice cars in Hoboken, but like there's just not enough yeah, of them but, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, I think I'd rather look at the eatery with uh, than a fresh direct truck in your painting. Right. Is my gut feeling. Uh, we're we're to, uh, getting close to the hour, so we're going to have to pump ahead here a little bit. Well, we're done so, with the paintings. Okay. Like, does so, anybody have any questions? But there's nobody. It's not live. It's not live. live. So you you, you only like, got oh. me here, Frank. Or we have to anticipate, um, like, what, what haven't I covered do you think people want to talk about? No, I think we're fine. But I think they want to see some of the person more, uh, more what Frank does when he's not painting. Uh, images, which are next, I think, right? Yeah, there's a couple yeah. other things. Okay. I've been interested in ships. Um, I, I want to finish the sentence by saying all my life, but it hasn't been all my life, really. I was interested in airplanes when I was a kid. And these are hobbies. Um, right. The the history of sailing ships is really fascinating. So do you really have that compass point painted on the floor? or is Yeah, a that's a sail that I pulled out of a dumpster at the marina. And because my floor was falling apart, it's linoleum. And you know how when you get like a office chair on linoleum, it starts to tear it up. Sure. So like a normal person would have their floor repaired, but uh, I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> but you painted the compass on. Or? I paint. Yeah. Well, I had I had the I had the sail. Right. And I'm like, oh, I know. I'll put the sail down. And then it was blank, and I thought, oh, I'll paint something. That's nice pretty on there. cool. So it's a compass point, and I was actually careful to. Uh, make sure that north is pointing actually north. So I had the compasses out. I had everybody on their smartphone, um, they might not use it, but they have like a little compass feature on there. Mm -hmm. And then I had like a Boy Scout compass and they didn't really agree with each other. Really? <laughs> yeah, so I, I got a couple of compasses I out. And I, but yeah. I, I was careful. About, I don't know why we're, now we're down right. in the weeds now. But I yeah. built ship models. Um, it's the greatest hobby. Uh, everybody should do it. Uh, but I'm interested in ships. Um, I started to... Uh, volunteering at the South Street Seaport Museum. Everybody should volunteer at a museum somewhere, wherever you are. Hoboken Historical well, Yeah, museum, Hoboken right? Historical, but it, like, give some time to a museum. It's certainly worth it. You won't get paid, but you're going to meet interesting people, and it's worthwhile. Everybody should do it. And I started volunteering at the South Street Seaport Museum, learned about all the ship stuff, and uh, it was fascinating, and it enriched my life, and I, like just want to talk about, like, can we do a, one of just schooners one day where I just talk about boats? <laughs> <laughs> planes trains right, and boats right I, you heard me talk about painting but right. i could talk let about we ships. do have a few other slides that illustrate some of your other interests yeah this and, is me sewing and th this ties in the nautical a little bit because i got interested in canvas sewing because there is a tradition of sewing canvas on sailing ships somebody on board the ship was taking care of the sails there's a certain technique of how they sewed it and the materials they were using. And I fell in love with this. I got a book on the topic and then I started sewing these bags. This is a tote bag, but I, I mean, as you can see, it's gotten very decorative and it's like a landscape now. And right. You know, um, yeah, these bags, this is more of a smaller, like a ditty bag. kind Yeah. Of thing this where, is just like a little tool bag. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and there's one of my, it's ship okay. Models. I'm going to say that, Kind of not last minute, but I said, Frank, you got to show some of your bags in this exhibit. And right. They're probably the only thing that are not Hoboken centric, uh, but they're right. beautiful. Well, thanks. And they use nautical themes and they are for sale. And uh, they're really one of a kind. And, uh, you know, they're, the paintings are amazing, but these bags are amazing. I, I actually own one. Uh, I bought one from Frank a while ago. And uh, I use it for gear 
and I get lots of comments. And uh, <laughs> well, thanks. It, yeah, good, positive comments, I should say. Sure. And uh, wow, that's a master of the ship. That's amazing. Yeah, that's the USS Constitution. But I, I guess the reason of including these photos is like I'm I'm a painter, but really I'm a person that makes stuff with my hands. And like if mm -hmm. I'm not painting, I'm still kind of feel like I should. Like I really want to do stuff with my hands. So like I'll probably learn how to knit someday. People who do knit probably understand like, oh yeah, you can just knit and watch a TV show. And I don't know. I just like I, I need to have like myself occupied. Right. We like that's to keep out of trouble, right? I guess. Yeah. 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 Okay. Ah, another interest. Yeah, this is a in the foreground is my bicycle with balloons attached to a stick, and in the background is the group uh, Bike JC, which I belong to. The JC stands for Jersey City, and they do a light up ride periodically throughout the summer. And people, it's sort of like Halloween with lights for your bicycle. So people dress up their bicycle, not themselves so much, and um, they're a lot of LEDs going on and it, it doesn't show up in this kind of a photograph, but I don't know electronics. So I did the balloons on my bike. <laughs> I like it. And some of these are pretty lengthy rides, right? Oh uh, yeah. You're driving like maybe like 10 miles or something. Okay. It's, it's not crazy. With balloons that can be challenging. It's, yeah. Yeah. It only broke once. Okay. This is um, the, uh, the Jersey city St. Patrick's day parade at the end and the bike JC group again, dresses up our bicycles. And, uh, I, I have an Irish background. I'm three quarters Irish, never been to Ireland, probably couldn't answer many questions on like an Irish history quiz, but like, it's, <laughs> I feel so, like I should be flying, literally flying the flag. Uh, if I'm in a parade and it's for St. Patrick's day, I'm going to have a big flag on my bicycle. I almost missed it. So that flag is keyed it's attached into to the, the bicycle. Bike. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm riding around the bike. So you're... the wind blowing, it's very dramatic. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Just the sound <laughs> alone. Right. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Is that the end? Oh no, we're not at the no. end. So this ties into the light up ride too, because this is a, um, uh, what's it called a zoetrope. So it spins. It's a, it's a big cylinder. And then the cones are to catch the wind and the wind blows into the cones and it spins the cylinder. The cylinder spins on a spindle that's attached to my bike helmet. And then there's vertical slits, which you can see in the photograph cut at equidistant intervals all the way around the giant cylinder. And on the inside of the cylinder, which you can't see in this photograph, there are, let's say there's uh, 16 slices in the can, in the, in the cardboard. There's an image in between each one of the slits on the inside and each image is slightly different than the other. So when it spins and you light up the inside, you can see only the image directly across. Are we getting too complex? No, you're, you're right on point. <laughs> you're all right. You can see only one image. It acts as the shutter on a camera as the slit goes by your eye. It, it allows you to see only one of the several images. And then as the next slit comes into view, as it spins, it's showing you the next image. So you get a uh, animated, you get animation without a camera. And then the, the other image, is it working and at night on one of the light up rides? I, I took the, the idea of light up your bike and I thought, well, what can we do with that where you're still like, answering the light part but doing something else too and i always wanted to make one of these so i did and it fit on my helmet and i felt as silly as you can imagine riding to the location where we'd start in daylight because nobody knew what the hell i had on top of my head and it was spinning but like it doesn't make any sense in daylight <laughs> um yeah i mean <laughs> You described it really well, oh, and thanks. this thing, Frank made it from scratch. It's beautifully put together, and um, I'm not, I, it's now in the possession of the museum, yes, but I'm not sure it's, if it's ours, but yeah, I think no, no, there was a yours. storage issue, maybe. Yeah, or? like picture this in your closet, and like, yeah. you, you know, you live in it's, an apartment, you know, you're not going to keep it. Yeah, so. the diameter is pretty great. It, if Bob and, didn't take it, it was going to go into the trash. Oh, anyway, I love this object. <laughs> And when I want to, you know, introduce someone about the zaniness of the museum and all the things we do, I will trudge this out and ride around with it. Oh, great. And people are like, what the hell? 
<laughs> it's the silliest and, thing. Because <laughs> uh, especially at night with the flickering light and the animation. And I've ridden down Willow Avenue uh, oh, going with it home at night. Oh, just nice. to see. Because it, it's set on a pin that you created. That's, yeah, I'd like to spin uh, it on. Yeah. Which is latched onto the helmet. So it's not going to lift off there. And it really wants to spin. It does and, spin, yeah. Yeah. And so I've ridden down Willow Avenue with it once. And I remember a car pulled over and sort of <laughs> cut me off and go, what the hell is that? And we got, you know, it was the way we connected. So this thing is pretty special. And I'm not exactly sure where it is right now, but I'll bring it out for Sunday. For oh, the there we go. Reception. Yeah, yeah. I'll um, wear it. But Yeah. I'll... I want to see your mom wearing it anyway. <laughs> right. Sure. Is that the last picture? We're almost I'm done. Not if people sure. have followed along this oh, long, we're going to sort of start to wind down. Yeah. And again, the reason this is pre-recorded, but people can watch it this coming Thursday. I'm sorry, this coming Friday, it will go up. And then we're really sort of trying to create a buzz for the reception on Sunday. Yeah, you're all welcome to come to the reception. Right. On it's Sunday. an in-person opening from two to five. The date is November fourteenth. And you get to meet Frank's mom, right? Your mom's My coming mom's from be Buffalo. There. My be... two sisters will be there. Like anybody I could get to come in here, I'm going to try to get them. Right. Coming. And we will be doing kind of a uh, reception in the walkway also. So if it gets too crowded up here, people mm. don't feel comfortable. Well, they people can are, enjoy people are going to want to see this terrific uh, on the avenue exhibit yes, here some right. of them probably haven't seen it yet sure and we we really didn't go into that but since most of your paintings are on the avenue mm -hmm. uh and the on um, and washington street is your studio as the title says right. we have a nice little tie-in here yeah it's nice that it, like that this show was up at the time when i was doing paintings just of washington street so. right yeah all planned yeah. of course I should thank everybody who's watched this this long because I like, I know I'll watch it and I'll be fascinated because I love to hear <laughs> myself talk, but I'm not sure everybody else wants to hear. Right. I like to hear artists talk about their work. I think you, you get to see the picture, but you never get to hear them talk about it. And it's a shame that we don't know what Monet was talking about. Like right. maybe there is somewhere in French a diary or something, but like there's no video of him describing what he was Pre video yeah. yeah uh no youtube stuff uh, no youtube morning. no um but i think you did a great job describing your work and I, so. I guess i would say the way you described it was very realistic uh -huh. even though we're talking about the work going a little more impressionistic so it kind yeah. of i might have been too, like i might have been too wordy and i should have made bigger blobs of words oh, instead of so many little there you words go. we'll we'll have to watch <laughs> and we can do maybe we can put in blobbing subtitles <laughs> to kind of go blah 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 when we get too detailed if somebody has a better word than blob <laughs> okay. it's too late now yeah i want yeah. to thank Rand though Rand's the one who set all this up you guys can't even see the, the folks at home yeah thank but, you uh, very much Rand. i Hoppe think rand's for... been doing all of these right yeah Rand is our technical engineer or producer right. and came up with And he's right medium. here. He's just not speaking. Yeah, he's behind he's not, the curtain and uh, pulling yeah. the strings and moving the arrow and about to shut us down, I think. Right. So see you uh, on Sunday, November 14th from 2 to 5. I can't wait. Like, if you can picture me right now, the show hasn't opened yet, but the work is done. And now the work for today, I brought the paintings to the museum. Right. They're right so downstairs. I am so excited that it's ha it's finally happening. Yeah. Because like, yep. like, I've yep. been working all summer long to this one point, and we're almost going to hit it like this Sunday. Okay. You will be fulfilled. Uh, right now, you again, you folks at home can't see it. We're in the space where the show, where the paintings are going to hang, and the walls are blank right now. So right, it's we got a ways to go, but this gave us fortitude to finish the job. Yeah, yeah. Can when I you guys your say, hand, oh yeah, sure. Okay, cool. And we're also holding up. Oh yeah, our, our Hoboken mug, which features oh, look at the a color. Crank. Don't. <laughs> What's that? It's not a flaw. Oh, the the, the, it's, the green screen. Oh, the green like screen color. is taking but some things one, out. But there's one of the one of the paintings. And the name of the show uh, is called "The Sidewalk Is the Studio," I believe. <laughs> yeah, the well, sidewalk is the studio. The studio. Yeah, yes, yeah. we coined this title together. Actually, but oddly, the okay. uh, the the green. Oh, here you is, you is have blending a, into you have the, a vortex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah dark. Good hole. thing we didn't wear a shirt that color. Anyway, okay. these guys are right. Tired of hearing us again. Thank you. Rand, thank you, audience. And we thank, thank you, Hudson County. County. Yeah, yeah Hudson County, 
uh, Cultural Arts and Heritage Affairs. Uh, Gina Hooling is uh, the director, and they are good friends to the museum and has, have helped us financially through the COVID crisis, and uh, that relationship will only grow. Yeah, I'm very grateful to the, you know, the state of New Jersey agency or just the Hudson it, County agency. You can credit the Hudson County. Right. Yeah. I think it's it's easy to just like tack those names on at the end of a show like this and say, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And then we're out the door. But I really do want to thank those people. I might not ever get to meet them, but they're through their work. I'm getting my work on the wall, which, you know, maybe if those people weren't helping. That you is know? true. You'd, you'd be out there so on I, the sidewalk. I'm grateful to these people that I haven't even met that are working about okay. New Jersey culture and Hudson County culture. There you go. And uh, again, uh, besides the upper gallery exhibit, our main floor exhibit is The Avenue, A History of Washington Street. And you can also check that out, this out on Sunday and we'll be up uh, for a good period of time. But uh, it's all happening here at the museum. Uh, we do a lot of events on the weekends and the walkway. And then uh, another virtual program we do uh, that is uh, uh, broadcast from the upper gallery is Hoboken Talks, separate from the Art Talks, by the way. Right. Yeah. And coming soon, we'll be interviewing Armando Lewis, who has a longstanding business here uh, with Sparrow Liquors, and his family has been connected to that business, it's, I believe. It's time for him to be recognized. Yeah. Yes, definitely, from yeah. the 1930s. You know his products. And then after that, we'll be doing an interview with Linda Volkemeyer, who is a longstanding athletic coach at Stevens. I'm going to guess 35, 40 years. Wow. And her specialty is fencing. And she grew up here in Hoboken and knows Hoboken like the back of her hand. So you'll be like w verbally sparring with her? Like uh, I hope not. Crossing swords We're friends, with her? No, I don't think I'm it's trying to get like a, yeah. a, a sword fighting uh, sure. con going here. But well, she actually has an incredible documentation of growing up here in Hoboken. Mm -hmm. Great. She's shared great memories of her mother. Uh, one of the German family. She comes from one of the German families. In oh, Hoboken. yeah, look at that name, Volkomer. So yeah. she's great. So I'm, I'll be doing that interview, and Bill Curran will be interviewing Armando Lewis. Once again, Hoboken Talks. So you guys can't see it, but the hook is coming in from stage left, and it's grabbing me, from, and it's pulling me off stage. Okay, signing off. Have a good weekend, everyone. See you on Sunday, November 4th. Bye. 14th. 14th, yeah. <laughs>